2016 was a standout year for gaming. No matter what genre of games you enjoy playing, whether it be RPGs, FPSs or strategy, there's something for everyone. I'm going to count down here my personal top 10 favourite games of the year. These might not necessarily be the highest rated games of the year, they might not necessarily align with your picks, but where's the fun in that? Also, because of the sheer number of amazing games I've played this year, we'll throw in a few honourable mentions near the end. So starting off the list is a game that won't be on 90% of the Game of the Year lists that you'll see. Anyone who knows me will know I'm a massive MMA fan. If you talk to me about anything MMA, we'll be best friends forever. Whilst the game hardly set the world on fire in terms of sales, UFC 2 was a nice progression on from the first EA developed game. The whole game flows better with smoother movement and animations, more robust head movement, and a reworked grappling system aimed towards bringing new players who may not be familiar with the intricacies of jiu-jitsu or wrestling in. There's a bunch of new modes, including Ultimate Team, where you upgrade your fighter by collecting move cards, and then you take your created fighters into leagues online. And there's a knockout mode with a classic fighting game style health bar, which is ideal for people who are new to the sport and just want to have some fun punching each other in the face. If you love MMA, then you need this game. If you're curious about the sport, then the knockout mode and robust tutorials will help you gain an understanding of what's going on. Oh, and if you're planning on playing online, then make sure you learn how to defend yourself in the clinch because the knees from the Thai plum clinch are still horrendously overpowered, even after patching. Just a fair warning. Next up, a racing game. Forza Horizon 3 is the latest entry in Forza's spin-off series based around exploring an open world during a race festival. It's far less serious than the standard number entries in Forza, and it allows for some awesome moments driving off-road vehicles, driving around residential areas, and go on -on one-on-one with trains and helicopters in all kinds of crazy special events. This entry is set in the outback of Australia, and the environments are beautiful. The forests, cities and beaches all look stunning and finding cool stuff to do all around the map is just a joy. There are tons of different vehicles in the game and unlike most racing games you get access to very fast cars early on so you don't have to spend the first 10 hours pottering around in a Nissan Micra waiting to get your Ferraris. The setup for the story is that you're designing your own race festival so you can pick what events you'd like to do and that means you can do literally anything you want. If you have a fondness for a specific type of vehicle you can do events based around that or if you want to dabble in lots of different types of races you can do that too. I can't talk about this game either without mentioning the yet again stellar soundtrack. There are loads of new stations alongside the old classics from previous entries and they're full of tunes that perfectly set the scene for your summer adventure. Doom hit me somewhat by surprise. When the news came out that Bethesda wasn't going to give out review copies for this game, it's usually a sign that the game isn't going to come out in a particularly good state. As games you usually are only held back because publishers think the game was going to get a negative reception from the press. Thankfully this really wasn't the case here. Doom is one of the best shooters to come out this year, which is tall praise considering just how many stellar shooters come out this year. It's a return to a gameplay experience that we don't often get now. High octane, fast paced, over the top gun combat. All of the maps are interesting and unique and you have upgradable weapons, you have secrets, you have little challenges. There's so much to do in each and every level that you're never bored all the way through the campaign. Whilst the game does have multiplayer, which in itself is a lot of fun, the star of the show is the single player campaign. Yet again, you find yourself on a one man mission to fight back the Hellspawn on Mars, and you'll do this with a wide array of meaty guns, and you'll fight back the Hellspawn all the time, feeling like a badass. It truly showcases a mentality that is sadly lost in a lot of modern era video games, which is that gameplay is king. You'll have a blast from start to finish all the time whilst listening to arguably the greatest soundtrack of this year. In 7th we have Ratchet & Clank on PS4. A reimagining of the original PS2 game with some altered story elements and completely reimagined worlds. Ratchet & Clank is arguably the prettiest game to be released on this system this year. I've always had a soft spot for these type of games and in recent years we've been sorely missing a standout action platformer but this game scratches that itch like no other. The guns feel satisfying and ridiculous with tons of different powers, and the weapons level up as you use them, meaning that the stuff you actually like using gets better over time the more you use it. Hopefully if we ignore the terrible movie that this game was linked to in the summer, the strong sales of this game itself will lead to another proper Ratchet game, as the last proper one we got was Cracking Time series back on PS3, and we need more games in this genre of this phenomenal quality, although we do have ukulele to look forward to in the near future. Everything that made these games special is still here, from the quirky goofball humour, 
to the responsive fluid controls. If only all remakes were done this well. It has been a long time since I have enjoyed this series. The last entry I fell in love with was Bad Company. The reason for that? Those two games had a fun single player campaign. And that's exactly why I love Battlefield 1. The multiplayer component is still the same stellar experience it has always been, even though I'm terrible at it. Whilst the campaign is hardly light-hearted in the vein of Bad Company, the telling of various people's experiences during the First World War and the struggles people faced in that brutal and horrific period of history is something that we really don't see very often in games. Each of the fairly short campaigns are unique and have you sneaking into bases, flying planes, driving tanks and going on rampages in metal armour suits. The sound design is amazing in Battlefield 1 from the crunch of boots on gravel to the little click when you reload a clip. Everything feels satisfying and immersive. And did I mention this game is stunningly beautiful as well. The explosions are stunning, detailed and varied environments and amazing lighting effects all make this game just a joy to witness. Provided your PC can play it, that is. As I said earlier, there have been a huge amount of stunning FPSs in 2016, but this one is absolutely worth your time. And now for another FPS. Don't worry, this entire list isn't just shooting games, I promise. But I did say earlier that this year has been one of the best in recent memory for this genre. Titanfall 2 makes me sad. Nowhere near enough people have bought and played it. And I think a huge proportion of this is down to EA. In their infinite wisdom, they decided it would be a good idea to release it right next to Battlefield 1 and Infinite Warfare. And that was a huge mistake as far too many people overlooked this frankly stellar game. I have always been championing the Titanfall series as I felt the first was criminally underrated. And this game is everything the first was, and more. More guns, more maps, more types of titans, more abilities, more ways to get around the map, more fluid, free running, and the list just goes on and on. Oh, and it has a bloody brilliant single player game that is the best of any FPS released this year in my opinion. The core of what makes the campaign so great is the building of a relationship between the player and his titan. And that's what carries you through and makes you care. It also helps that each mission is fun, memorable, unique, with a bunch of moments that will stay with you long after you've finished playing it. The online has had an overhaul too with some new modes, a better levelling up system, more unlockables and some amazing maps. Oh and on that note, Respawn have said that all DLC maps for this game will be free so they don't segment their audience. So it's a real shame that EA haven't treated this game with the love and respect that the developers have as this should be played by all FPS fans and it's one of the best games released in 2016. This is the last FPS on this list. I promise. How could you possibly do this list and not include Overwatch? This game's amazing. I usually begrudge putting a multiplayer only game on a list like this because I question the value for money. But for it to be so high on this list just shows how special this game is to me. There's been a very welcome change in shooters lately where characters are no longer just faceless blank nobodies and they have, you know, character. Each playable hero in this game has its own backstory and personality which has led to a huge amount of fan fiction and definitely no porn gifts. The game at its core is an objective based team FPS which is comprised of teams filled with different heroes with different abilities. It's the different team compositions which in my opinion makes the game so addictive as there are no two games which are ever the same. Different heroes are best suited to different situations and there's nothing as satisfying as when you and your team work together to neutralise a bastion who has been wrecking your team or shut down again you just won't leave you alone. All the maps unique and memorable with their own backstory as well and built fantastically to allow the different facets of play with ledges only accessible to highly mobile characters such as Farah or choke points that can be held by a bastion or a Reinhardt with the constant addition of new modes, new maps, new heroes and special events giving access to special themed skins there is always something new to experience in Overwatch and it's a game I fully intend to put many more hours into yet. Now for a PS4 exclusive. Pound for pound, it's easy to argue that Naughty Dog are one of, if not the best, developer in the world. They've knocked out of the park once again with Uncharted 4. It's the final game in the Nathan Drake story, and Uncharted 4 is centred around Nate and his brother on the hunt for pirate treasure. I was gripped by the plot and character development from start to finish, and I personally felt like the characters felt more believable and honest this time around, and it made me love it all the more. The gameplay is more of the same, which is by no means a bad thing. There's a bit more of an emphasis on stealth here with long grass areas designed to help you clear out the pack and make enemy numbers more manageable. The parkour is ridiculous as ever with Nate climbing mountains and jumping between buildings seemingly effortlessly. The set pieces are also over the top and crazy, just like they should be. 
with car chases, battles on lifts, and a few moments that I won't spoil here. As I just mentioned, this is supposedly the last game in Nate's story, and I felt the ending was satisfying, which isn't something you can say very often these days. The multiplayer mode returns again in Uncharted 4 with cover shooting competitive action. It's fun, but it's never been something that I've been particularly interested in, but it has a dedicated fan base who are really into it. As a huge lover of story-driven games, games like this are an absolute joy for me. Stunningly beautiful graphics, amazing sound design, a well-told story, with a perfect balance of tension, humour, build-up and payoff. And the same gameplay that has hooked me since the first instalment. If you own a PS4, you should own Uncharted 4. The toss-up between first and second was really hard for me, so you can interchange these if you'd like, although there are plenty of people who would disagree with both of these being on the list in the first place. But anyway, in second place is Inside. Inside is a must-play game. There is no other way to describe it. From Play Dead, the studio behind Limbo, this game follows many of the studio's previous game's sensibilities. It's an atmospheric puzzle platformer game centred around a small boy who is the protagonist. Everything about this game's execution is flawless, and that's why it's quite hard for me to talk about it. The art style is striking and unique, with the dreary, uniform colour palette that sets the tone perfectly for the story. The sound design is haunting, eerily quiet in places, and there are swells in all the right places. The gameplay is weirdly the least important part of the game for me. It's about the experience of playing it, the way you interact with the world, and how it makes you feel that appeals to me so much. I know that sounds pretentious, but when you nail every component of the game so flawlessly, it's hard not to sing its praises. The game at no point outstays its welcome, with each puzzle cleverly designed to never frustrate in difficulty, but require some thought and input from the player. The length of the game is just perfect. It will take you around two hours or so to beat, depending on how much time you spend exploring, taking in the world and looking for secrets and stuff. And that's exactly how long a game like this should be. Oh, and there's that twist and that ending. It was something pretty special too. Please play this game. Even though it's not my number one game of 2016, it's actually the only game I think I could give a 10 out of 10. As I said at the start of the video, there was a staggering amount of fantastic games this year. So here's a quick montage of a small handful of other games I loved playing in 2016. So here it is, my favourite game of 2016. Whilst there are games more technically proficient, games with better graphics and certainly games with less issues and flaws than this on the list, when I really thought about it, the game I enjoyed most was definitely Final Fantasy XV. I cannot remember the last time a game has grabbed me in the way that this has. When I was playing it I didn't want to stop, and when I did stop all I could think about was when I could play it again, and I haven't been like that with a game since Oblivion came out. It's hard to explain why I love this game so much, given that its flaws are widely reported, but I'll give it a go. JRPGs have always been one of my favourite genres in games, but there are two things that I really hate in those type of game, and that is random battles and turn-based combat. Neither of those things are present in Final Fantasy XV. The two things that truly make a standout JRPG, in my opinion, are the story and the combat system, and that's why I love this game so much, as to me, it nails both elements. The combat system is akin to that found in Kingdom Hearts with a real-time, very action-orientated, over-the-top combat style based around flashy sword moves and spells that you craft from resources that you find around the world. The story at its core is a tale about four best friends going on a road trip. While some of the ensemble cast are fleshed out and portrayed better than others and some of the backstory you kind of need to watch the movie which is kind of a shitty move. The evolving relationship throughout the campaign of the four main characters is a joy to watch unfold. They fight, 
they laugh, they argue, and everything that happens feels real. Final Fantasy XV is an open world, and often it seems like a modern open world sandbox game has a massive scale just for the sake of it, and the world is devoid of anything actually worthwhile to do. Whereas I didn't feel like this was the case here. Even just cruising along in the car to one of the many previous Final Fantasy soundtracks is something that a lot of critics slated, but I enjoyed it because you see a lot of things going on around you. You see like monsters out in the world that you can fight, you can discover new outposts, and you can go and explore and meet new people who will give you quests. And I always felt like it was something worthwhile doing. That translates to immersion of a feeling of being part of the world. All of the missions were fun, and whilst in typical JRPG fashion, some of the side quests are a bit forced in their reasoning, the gameplay was fun, so I didn't really care that I was a prince having to go and fetch some frogs for a random lady I met at an outpost. True to other Final Fantasy games, all of the cutscenes are stunningly rendered, and there are plenty of jaw-dropping moments where, for me... I couldn't believe I was witnessing a PS4 game. Like in all things, when you love something, you can accept it for its flaws. And whilst horrendously forced stealth section towards the end and some incredibly awkward camera controls in places hold this game back from true greatness, the massive things that I love about this game makes this my favourite game of 2016.